Shut up and sit down. Welcome to the Health and Wealth Podcast with your hosts, Tim and Carter. What's trending in Richards? Carter Wilcoxie, founder of CSI Financial Group here with my co-host and former wealth advisor, Tim James, founder of chemicalfreebody.com and your new health advisor. This is the show where we reveal the connection between physical and financial abundance. Hey, and Richards, Carter Wilcoxon here with my co-host, Tim James. Tim James, how are you doing today, bud? Hey, man, I'm doing awesome. I'm excited to have this golf guy on today. I, I know, I know. It is, is I am I'm so stoked I can't even tell you how excited I am that uh, my good dear friend, Ted Purdy, PGA Tour winner, is uh, on here with us today on the Health and Wealth Podcast to talk to the enrichers, to be able to share some some of his uh, his stories, some of the things that are happening in, in his life right now, where he's going, where he's been, the direction he's headed. And uh, he wears multiple hats. I will tell you that much right now. But it is a true honor, Ted, to have you on today. Thank you. Well, thanks for the invite. This is going to be fun. Yeah, a- absolutely. So uh, why don't we start off, if you don't mind, uh, Ted Purdy, let's talk a little bit about and maybe i'll give a little bit of the story you know we're, we're fellow members at the same club uh, i got i met you right after you know you were going through some of your you know personal challenges and everything and and with the the way things are going you've got the big smile on your face i know you're a lot happier than you know than you when you that you know a year and a half ago or something like that when it kind of when i think when we first met maybe two years now um but the the backstory you know I was trying to play in this group one day and then I got paired with Ted Purdy and I'm like, um, I don't know if this guy's a prima donna. I don't I'm, So I'm like, well, he's in my group, but there's three of us. So I'm going to put my bag on the back of this other guy's cart. Cause I'm not sure if he even wants me in this cart with him. Right. I have no idea. I'm making an assumption about Ted Purdy, but he's not a PJ tour player. Right. By the way, that comes from an experience I had with Phil Mickelson, but that's another story for another time. Um, so I'm like, I'm I'm talking to the guy running the uh, the group that day, and he goes, "Hey man, he goes, you don't want to be on the on the bag or have your bag on with that guy with that other member." He's like, "Throw it on with Ted." I was like, "You sure?" He's like, "Yeah." I said, "All right, cool." I mean, I wanted to ride with a professional golfer, of course. So, <laughs> so I throw my bag on. By the time we get to the first hole, and Ted will talk a little bit about this later on. Come to find out, he's in the insurance business, and we have a lot of things in common and we just like hit it off like from the beginning so anyway ted if you want to talk a little bit about you know um uh, you know from your perspective on 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 all that stuff and how that happened yeah well your listeners probably don't even know who i am i um yeah let's talk about that <laughs> i uh, uh grew up in phoenix arizona i grew up on um, moon valley country club next to karsten solheim so i'm a ping staff player have been my whole life um i was the only eight-year-old in the 80s i have a full set of ping i2s when it was taking you know a year to get a set um but and because i grew up on the golf course uh the rest is history i uh went down to the university of arizona uh got my finance degree uh i'm in the hall of fame down at uva for golf um when I was in college, I was competing against a guy at Stanford named Tiger Woods. Uh, I was able to take him down a couple of times in college, and uh, I took him down in, on the PGA Tour as well. So um, my first year on the PGA Tour was 1999. Uh, I still actively play, but I'm, you know, I tell everybody I'm one of the old fat guys now, and I'm only getting in about a dozen events a year, but... Um, so to, because I have so much free time, um, a friend of mine has an insurance company, an uh, insurance business um, the, called the Monolith Group, and he asked me to help him out. And I'm a finance guy and, um, you know, a finance degree. And so I went and got my licenses and, uh, and I'm a PGA Tour player and a, a licensed producer <laughs> in the insurance world, so. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's fun. I'm having a great time. It, it was great to meet Carter at Moon Valley Country Club. And, um, and here we are, you know, two years later, I'm on your pad- podcast. Pretty cool. 
I, I mean, who, who knew, right? Well, yeah. uh, so now he's modest, right? And But let's be a little bit specific and let's talk a little bit about what it was like coming down the stretch of winning your very first golf tournament at the Byron Nelson. Now, we're not talking about some offshoot PGA Tour event. We're talking about Lord Byron's events in mm -hmm. Dallas, Texas. Uh, why don't we talk a little bit about what that was like, you know, your, your feelings and your emotions and, you know, channeling, you know, past successes for maybe college or when you were eight years old with, with your own ping eye twos. Let's talk a little bit about what that was like for you. Yeah. So, um, it was the 2005 Byron Nelson. It, uh, they called them the fab five. We're all playing. So it was tiger, Ernie Els, Phil Mickelson, Ratif Goosen, and VJ Singh. They called those guys the five fab five. And at the time, and, um, all five of them were in the field. And, um, I was in the third to last group on Sunday. So, um, I was third from last in playing in twosomes. And, um, I hit every green, every fairway. I shot 65 and, uh, ended up beating VJ Singh and Sean O'Hare by a shot. Um, but it was funny, like that week, I I had listened to a another. A, well, we didn't have podcasts back in that day. But it was actually an audio tape of a guy named Mac Newton, and Mac said he gave this um, analogy where or this where they did a study with three groups of free throw shooters at the University of uh, Michigan State, Michigan State University, where one group practiced free throws. The other group meditated and practiced free throws. And the third group just meditated about practicing three throws for a month. And at the end of the month, the group that that hadn't shot a basketball at all and just thought about it improved their free throw shooting by 30%. The people that just practiced didn't get much better. And the people that meditated and shot got a little better. So... Um, I went into that week, I go, you know what, I'm just going to visualize and I'm going to visualize the shots. I'm going to visualize my putts going in the hole. I'm not going to, you know, so I, I, my thing was, I'm not going to take a practice swing. I'm not going to take a practice putting stroke. I'm just going to visualize, get up and hit. And, and I was amazing. <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> That's so, awesome. Um, and the other thing that I I, uh, I would get over, the other thing Mac Newton said in it was, he says, tell yourself a thousand times you like yourself. I like myself, I like myself, I like myself. So I would get over my putts. And, you know, normally when you're a professional, well, a lot, professional golfers or professional athletes or, you know, if we don't do it right, we get up frustrated and we get, um, you know, the, Trying to be perfect, oh, right? Trying to be perfect, or you miss a putt and you get frustrated. So I just told myself, you know what? I like myself. I don't care if this putt goes in or not. And um, and Max said that uh, the guy who cares the least wins. So I just went into that week, you know, not caring and telling myself I like myself and, and visualizing, and, uh, and it turned out to be a winning formula for the week. Now um... – Go ahead, Tim. Maybe you got uh, something you want. Well, to yeah, talk. I was just thinking. Uh, it's kind of genius that you got your insurance license because you know you can literally you know tee up, drive, and then go over and talk to people and start selling annuities. They're the perfect demographic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, golf, handing out uh, handing out cards. Golf is the elevation of every occupation. Yeah, for sure. Hey, I'm good. At, I'm good at golf, but I'm I'm really good at helping people protect their money. Here's my card. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. So, um, you know, I, I do want to know, cause I don't know if I've even asked you this, you know, when we were, when we're hanging out and, uh, you know, having some drinks or, you know, dinner or whatever, hanging out at Bobby D's. Right. Um, I don't even know if I ever asked you, what was it like and how much time did you get to spend with Lord Byron? I mean, and, and for those who podcast, you know, in Richards, if you don't know who Byron Nelson is, he only has the most consecutive wins on the PGA Tour in history. 11 wins in a row. That's who yeah. we're talking about here. So, but I, I do want to know, and in, in Richards, our in Richards, that's who we call, what, our, what we call our listeners, they want to hear what was it like 
hanging out with uh, Lord Byron and how much time did you get to spend with him? Yeah, so I, I was fortunate he was still alive. Um, and because I was the third to last group, I finished about, you know, 45 minutes an hour before the leaders or the league group finished. Um, so you sign your scorecard. Uh, Tom Lord Byron had his big chair right on the 18th green and him and Peggy were, were there in the right. And then I was invited to go sit with Byron and I basically just sat on his armchair for 45 minutes and, um, you know, he was looking at the scoreboard and he goes, Ted, you didn't have a bogey today. He goes, I don't think I've ever played a round of golf without a bogey. And I'm like, I'm sure you did, Byron. <laughs> I'm sure you, you have lots of rounds without bogeys. You probably yeah. have well with no bogeys. Um, but then P Peggy and I started, you know, and Byron it, it used to write letters to every champion on the PGA Tour. So if whoever won that week, the you know, the Sony Open winner, he'd write a letter to the to the uh, Sony Open winner. Right? And then the Waste Management winner, he'd send. So everybody that won a golf tournament while Byron was alive got a handwritten congratulations note from Byron Nelson. And, um, you know, and that's, you know, I have that congratulations letter framed. And, and I think Tiger's framed all of his from Byron. Um, it's just a really cool story thing that Byron used to do and it got me in the habit of whenever I wanted to appreciate somebody or something or you know good job I write a lot of handwritten notes too and it it, it really means a lot to people and yeah. um so that was something that Byron kind of taught me and um the other thing is he had me because we became got you know friendly and he had me come speak at his uh, charity Christmas dinner and you know, I told stories about the PGA Tour, and uh, we had a great, great friendship. I stayed at his house um, in Fort Worth, so just just a great, great guy. And um, yeah, I was honored to have won the tournament, but also to have been able to spend a lot of time with him. Yeah, that's that's obviously you know, um, I mean, envious would be an understatement for uh, for any. PGA tour, you know, player, it, it'd be, it's much like, you know, being able to spend a little bit of time with uh, Arnold Palmer. Right. I mean, uh, and right now spending time with Jack Nicholas, right. Cause we know it's just a matter of time, you know, uh, Gary player, right. Th these are, these are icons, right. The big three, right. Um, back in the day. So it's, uh, it, it had to be uh, almost uh, for me, I would think it's surreal, but you, you've been around that for so long. <laughs> The first time you maybe even met Byron, but being able to spend that intimate time with him had to be pretty cool. Yeah, no, he just, I mean, he was the ultimate gentleman. Um, he was a great Christian guy and um, just an amazing guy. Amazing for the sport. And, he, you know, he's just an amazing guy. Yeah, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, so, hey, Tim, do you have anything you want to uh, kind of sort of chime in on um, – and, and ask if there's anything, I know you're not necessarily really a golfer, but is there anything that you were thinking, I would have the PGA tour player, you know, this maybe if I ever, you know, maybe, maybe recreationally you've played golf or whatever, anything you want to ask Ted? Well, I would just, I would want to know what, um, what you've ever learned about nutrition as far as, uh, you know, using that as a, a um, you know, obviously as an added advantage, because usually when you're in sports, like I played baseball at a high level for 30 years, it was always like if somebody said I could hit the ball harder, farther, I could, you know, have a higher batting average or whatever. I'm like, I'm doing it. Yeah. So what was something that you actually um, uh, was told as far as nutrition or health that, that actually produced results for you? Yeah. So um, my trainer is a guy named Mac Newton in Phoenix, Arizona. Mac Newton's a three time world Taekwondo champion. He's in the world uh, martial arts hall of fame. He has studios here in Phoenix, Arizona. He's got a Super Bowl ring when he was the trainer for the um, the Cowboys in the '90s, and he has three, uh, three or two or three World Series rings uh, when he was the trainer for the Oakland A's in the '80s. So, um, I got referred to Mac when I was before I got on the PGA Tour. I was kind of struggling and I wasn't making much money and 
I think I made 30 grand on playing golf before I met Mac. And I went in September. I remember went in September, it was hot. His room is 110 degrees when you work out. Um, but uh, the ne very next year, I made a million six. The next year, I made two million. The next year, I made three million. I mean, after getting in shape and um, doing his, he called it the three two eating plan. And the three two eating plan is basically the um, there's three things you can eat: lean uh, vegetables, fruit, and lean protein. Those are the three things you eat. Two things you can drink water and 100% fruit juices or vegetable juices. So he, he makes it super simple. If it's 100% juice, you can drink it or water. And if there's, if it's lean meat and nothing processed and vegetables and fruit, you can eat it. So he made it super simple and also wanted you to have a, he calls it the big five, a green vegetable with every, you know, every meal. Like, and he called the big five broccoli, asparagus, Brussels sprouts, collard greens, and I forget the fifth. But um, <laughs> but you had to have one of the green vegetables with every meal. And and honestly, when I would just do his Mac diet, and like on the course, if I had access to, or I'd tell the the the, the club, I'd say, hey, can you put a couple hamburger patties in Ziplocs, and I. You know, I'd be on the course and I'd eat a hamburger patty. And then I was in a playoff once at Harbor Town against Stuart Sink. And it was late and it was a long day. And out of my bag, I pulled a bag of broccoli, raw broccoli, literally. And I was eating raw broccoli on the golf course. And Gary McCord was giving me so much hell on, on the telecast. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I just had like carrots and broccoli and whatever anything that was green and real and and uh, fresh in my bag um you know no power bars no um processed you know things and stuff like that so when i uh, when i ate properly and when i worked out and and did a lot of sweating i i i made a lot of money so they yeah. go hand in hand <laughs> Yeah, thanks for sharing that, brother. It just it, it really does make a lot of sense because um, that that plan eliminates a lot of processed foods and it eliminates a lot of um, uh, in, a lot of improper food combining that people are doing that's really destroying their gut health and that kind of stuff. And and, and it, it simplifies it. It definitely simplifies it. So, yeah. well, we're going to take a quick break, guys. And when we get back, um, we'll get we'll get more into um any other stories that uh that ted's got and then maybe anything that he's doing now um in the insurance business or you can talk about you know anything else that you have going on we'll be right back yeah great if you build it they will come for most financial advisors the subject of estate planning for their clients is relegated to a side activity only to be left to disconnected third-party outsourcing. Rather than recognizing the opportunities it inherently provides, advisors very often view estate planning related work as a time-consuming, unproductive process. Unfortunately, this kind of remiss and costly attitude is derived mostly from unquestioning acceptance of half-truths or even outright fiction. Another factor is simply the lack of relevant knowledge and a team of experts to partner with. Hello, I'm Carter Wilcoxon, CEO and founder of CSI Financial Group and architect of the Advisor Partner Platform. Over the next few minutes, I'm going to update you on how this one of a kind and unprecedented process has changed the lives for so many. When we set out on this journey to connect advisors with clients, we never imagined that we would actually find out that clients or prospective clients needed advisors just as much. The knowledge that we have gained when making accessible our entire team approach has brought to the general public a seamless, cost-effective, and comprehensive way to have true peace of mind. Because of this, when our advisor partners use this collaborative effort, the reward for them at the end has been nothing short of life-changing. 
All too often we hear words like revolutionary, innovative, or turnkey when describing something to make it more than it is. And in this IMO world that we've been competing in, those are descriptions of empty promises that have given this industry an unenviable reputation. So, after almost two decades of being pigeonholed and forced to be part of a system that we didn't create, it was our true intention to recreate. CSI Financial Group is paving the way for what we now call ourselves a practice development organization, or PDO. Our advisor partner platform is just the beginning of what we are building, and we are encouraging those who are wanting to truly transform their business and stand out from the rest to come learn more. When you partner with us, you'll get all the exclusive tools, resources, and processes needed to cement your ideal clients while creating professional confidence. We look forward to hearing from you and sharing more. Thank you. What's up, in Richards? Tim here with Carter. We yeah. got Ted, we've got Ted Purdy in the house, uh, PGA Golf uh, Tour winner and insurance agent, and he's ra- wrangling up a whole lot of food to help feed people. So let's wh- why don't we get into this? Uh, do you want to talk, Ted, about the the food bank first, or do you yeah, want to so, talk about your, yeah? Let's do that. It's an interesting story. Um, uh, there's a really great so. My dad's a, a good Christian guy and uh, and his one of his best friends. So they at the end of the year, they look at you know the top ten Christian organizations that they can donate to at the end of the year. And number one was this food bank called Midwest Food Bank, based out of Bloomington, Illinois. But they had um, seven locations around the country, and they have one in Haiti and one in in Africa, a, f- a food bank. So um, Eric Sheld, all the, uh, my dad's buddy donates to Midwest food bank. They, the founder gets his, you know, it was like a $5,000 check. So it wasn't a huge donation, but it was, you know, it was, wasn't chump change. Yeah. And, um, the founder, uh, uh, David Keezer is his name. David calls Eric and says, thank you. And Eric's like, I don't make money all the time. And I never had a founder call me and thank me. But so they started talking. Well, the next year they look at the top 10, you know, Christian charities. And number one, again, is this Midwest Food Bank. And it's based off their expense ratios and the the money that they are, the goods and services that that they provide the uh, community. He donates again. David Keezer calls him again. And he's just so impressed. He said, you know what? How do we get a, Midwest Food Bank to Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, and David said, you just, you just, you just do it. <laughs> so my dad and Eric put a board together. They raised the initial funds. They bought a warehouse in Gilbert, Arizona. Um, and they started bringing in food through the, through the network of the Midwest Food Bank. Um, and that happened just over three years ago. They came to, and last year they gave $20 million of food away. And this year we're going to give away just in the Phoenix, Phoenix, Arizona, uh, the whole state of Arizona we support, including the, the reservations. They're going to give over $60 million for the food away this year um, and during this pandemic. It's just phenomenal. But the story of me going to the food bank and helping out is they they had lost their their executive director they needed help um and i had called my dad and eric and i said hey i want to buy a golf course called cold water in in phoenix will you will you guys you know help me put up the dough to buy this golf course so they drive out and they meet me at the golf course and they look at it and they go yeah this is great we'll buy it you know we'll help you buy it but you know what we need somebody to run the food bank for us So if we're going to lose money running a golf course, we might as well just lose money hiring you to run the food bank. (laughs) So it wasn't, 
you know, what I was intending to do. It wasn't what I wanted to do. It, I, so the first day I, you know, I'm coming to the food bank, kicking and screaming, like, what am I doing here? Like this, I don't know how to run a food bank. Like really? <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, I get there and, um, and just fell in love from the first second I got there. I, the first patient I, I go load out the, this, the charities come every 15 minutes. They come through the warehouse. We fill them, their vehicles, their vans, their trucks, their, their cars, whatever they've got. We fill their cars up and vans up with food. And then 15 minutes later, there's another charity coming through. So I show up the first day and every 15 minutes I'm filling up these cars and I'm asking these amazing people, you know, what are they doing? And like the first lady says, well, I run a, a home for uh, teenage mothers. So we basically are raising the mother and the baby, um, you know, and we support them with food. And, and then the next guy comes to them and he goes, well, I have a, a church inside the prison in Rocky Point. And I support the, the, I built this church inside the prison in Rocky Point and I support them with food. So we filled up his trailer, you know, just every 15 minutes, there's somebody doing some great, amazing things for people. And I was just hooked and I went home and uh, woke up the next day and I felt like I had a hangover, like I felt horrible. And I, you know, and I went to work and then, you know, the energy came back and I felt great again. And I was talking to one of the guys who was a recovery guy who was volunteering at the food bank. And he says, yeah, he goes, Ted, serving is just like doing cocaine. It's like doing drugs or alcohol because you get that high when you serve. And the next morning you're, you know, you feel burned out. So the only way you can get that high back is you got to go serve again. <laughs> so I use that a lot that, and, um, but the, you know, so the recovery that's, you know, and that's why the recovery, uh, guys really, and gals love to volunteer or, or encouraged to volunteer because it is kind of, it does lift your spirits and does make you feel good. So, um, anyway, I was, I, had a, I was under a six month, I started in November of, of 19, and I had a six month contract until we found a proper executive director and then COVID hit. And then when COVID hit, it was all hands on deck. I mean, that the need for food was astronomical and like there was no food in the grocery stores. There was no toilet paper. There was, I mean, I don't know if you remember the first few months of the, the oh. pandemic, it was crazy. Well, the, the demand on the food bank was exponential. Um, and we were trying to help so many people we'd have distributions and there would be three mile long lines of cars, you know, one by one coming through to get a couple boxes of food, you know, and we did distributions and, um, there's the need's still there. The, this pandemic has really hurt people economically. Um, so there's, you know, we're still working hard to, to, to get through it, but, um, it's been life changing for me. They, they hired a proper executive director from um, Vanguard, uh, a gal named Mary Lee. She came over from Vanguard. She's very successful, you know, one of the leaders over there. And I think she was making, you know, a good mid six figure salary. And now she's not at the food bank, but <laughs> she's having more fun too. So it's just, uh, it's been life changing for me. Uh, to be part of the food bank. That, that, that's awesome. Um, yeah. so is that, is the, uh, the warehouse that I went that one time when I, when I came in with, you know, our, uh, our network estate planning attorney, uh, Sierra Lister was, is that the same warehouse that they built originally or bought? Yeah, or they just bought that. Yeah. That's the same warehouse. Same. Um, during COVID we were donated another 90,000 square foot warehouse that we filled to the brim in central Phoenix. Um, so because of the philanthropic people around Phoenix, you know, we've been able to, to really uh, serve the people for sure. It's, yeah. been, it's been great. Yeah. The community is really kind of, you know, the name really, you know, why is it, why is it called Midwest? Well, it is, but um, 
when they realize what we're doing, uh, the community is really, really uh, supporting us. It's fun. Yeah, it was funny whenever I remember when we went there that day, I'm like, Midwest, like, I, I don't get it. But then they they played that, you know, it was like maybe a 10 minute, you know, trailer or, or yeah. promo or whatever. And then it started in the Midwest, which is hence the name. And then yeah. what, seven locations, I think you said uh, across the country. Yeah. So now there's nine. Um, we just opened one um, in Dallas and one in New York City, just outside of New York City in Hershey, Pennsylvania. So, um, and then we've got the two, one in Haiti and one in Africa. Wow. But yeah, it's the Midwest food. And it's, you know, it's just started by this, these three brothers in Bloomington. And you look at the good that they're doing. They're the largest food bank in the country right now. They're doing more pounds and more dollars worth of food than, than any other food bank. Um, and they go, you know, that's a God thing. Like, it's not because of anything we're doing. That's it's uh, yeah. it's a it's really an amazing place. I think it's pretty. What I what I'm noticing from that is that from that personal touch where that guy reached out, where the owner after the food bag reached out to to your to your friend, <laughs> that that had that's what started. Like, hey, I really like this. You know, if he wouldn't have reached out, maybe you wouldn't. Even, that would have never happened, and all those people mm-hmm. would have been served. No, you're exactly right. I mean, it might, it's kind of the same thing as Byron writing the thank you card. I mean, it, it means a lot to, to get a little thank you call or a little thank you card. A, a yeah, you framed note. it. Yeah, I framed it. Yeah. <laughs> you, you framed the darn thing. So yeah. I think uh, for me, a takeaway is, uh, you know, and like I did that when I was back in the mortgage business because I, my coaches had me do it. I'm like, I was writing out thank you cards. It became kind of mechanical. But, you know, when you were doing it, you I, I'd have my assistant put the thank you cards on my desk. And every day I was writing thank you cards out, 10 thank you cards to people. And I can't tell you how far that went. It's like, God, maybe I should, I'm going to get back into that. But what I do as a, a business owner is I, I, I reach out to my clients. I try to call, personally call 10 people a day. And mm-hmm. it blows their mind. It yeah. blows their mind. So. For those of you listening, whether you're a financial advisor, business owner, mom, dad, it doesn't really matter, man. It's like there's certain things that you can do that will lift not only it will lift your spirits up and that's volunteering. Like when you went down to the food bank, there's just something about giving without any expectation for return, Mm -hmm. Um, creating when you create things like whether it's music or building a little you know, a wood structure or something with a little wood music box for your daughter, stuff like that creates it. And I also think like, you know, writing, writing letters or calling people for no reason, just to, just to tell them, thank you. It's that personal touch. And that's, what's really missing today in the technology age. So if we can incorporate that in there, I think it's, I think there's some real, real power in that, not just for the clients and building that client um, uh, loyalty and that kind of stuff, but also for yourself spiritually. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, you feel good. Mm -hmm. Right. You just told me you, you, every time you, you know, I don't know, give this food bank deal. And now it's like, you can't wait to get there. Yeah, no, that's right. That's, that's pretty cool. So anyway, those were, those were, those were my takeaways. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, when, whenever, I mean, just to piggyback off of that, you know, anytime you're, you know, serving people, that's absolutely what's um, going to help you feel much better about yourself. So you know, kudos to you. And that was, that was awesome. And yeah. I remember at first you told me you were going to be working at the food bank. I'm like, Wait a second. My buddy Teddy's going to be, by the way, Teddy Bear. That's his nickname. My son started calling him that as soon as he met him. Uh, by the way, st- talk about someone who has no idea who Ted Purdy is. That's a you know a 13-year-old kid, right? He, he doesn't know anything. <laughs> when we told Carter Samuel that, you know, well, you understand, like, this is a big, like, he's a, he's a PGA Tour winner. Like, you, you have aspirations. You're out there. You're grinding it. And um, just to tell a quick story. I remember the very first time you met Carter Samuel and, uh, and and you can talk a little bit about your, your, I want to call it a gadget, but the, the, um, the grip, um, the pretty grip. Pretty grip, right. Uh, and that was, but that was like number one at the PGA tour at merchandise show. At one. Mm-hmm. Day. Yeah. So Carter Samuel, um, actually coach comes in, he brings one of those in and I'm like, what is that? And you tell me all about it. And I'm like, wrap it up. I'll buy it right now. So I, I give him the money. Ted, talking about a servant mentality. 
this is the middle of summer, right? In Phoenix, Arizona, we just got through playing golf. You know, we're, we've had, you know, maybe a couple beers at the, uh, in the clubhouse. He takes Carter Sammy out to the range and shows him how to use it. It was like, he was gone for like an hour. <laughs> so yeah. that was, uh, that, that was amazing. But that's, that's, that's kind of heart that, uh, that Ted Purdy has. But Hey, if you don't mind, let's talk a little bit about how you serve, you know, your clients and let's talk a little mm-hmm. bit about monolith group and, and maybe how that got started and, you know, who it is that your ideal client is and, and what you're trying to do to, to help serve people in that, you know, financial solution. Yeah. So, um, we had, uh, I went to Brophy prep here in Phoenix, Arizona, all boys prep school and, um, senior year economics was taught by a guy named, um, the, our teacher was amazing. He was a, a bond trader, uh, Ray Zimmerman. He was a retired bond trader from New York, moves to Arizona, wants to give back. So he goes to Brophy and says, Hey, I'll, I'll be your senior economics teacher. And, you know, and I won't take a salary. So we were the, the seniors at Brophy while Ray was there, we're getting this bond trader, you know, e- economic genius, you know, teaching us how to, about economics and how Alan Greenspan was the most powerful man on the planet. And, you know, we had to get, read the Wall Street Journal every morning. And um, so anyway, we, well, in my class uh, was, my classmate was a guy named John Gazowski. Well, John Gazowski, but Ray got us so excited about economics and finance that you know, I went and got my finance degree and, and half of the guys that, you know, graduated our class are in the finance world and um, just because of this one teacher. But John was a bond trader in Chicago. Well, he patented a process where a high net worth individual can purchase life insurance and never write a check for. Um, and he does it by creating a bond going to the bond market and raising the money through the capital markets to purchase life insurance for an individual. So uh, it's just a, it's a brilliant, you know, amazing product. You obviously have to be super high net worth. There has to be a super high need for, for life insurance. But um, when I was introduced, when I, you know, I, John's now based out of Fort Worth. And when I was in Fort Worth playing the Colonial, uh, John, I was, you know, went to dinner with John. He says, hey, you know, why don't you come work? You know, I'm hiring. Why don't you come work for me? And I said, well, and I just love John and I love his product. And um, so I went to work for uh, for John. And, um, and because it's such a niche product and, there, you know, there aren't a, a ton of sales. Um, so I can work at the food bank and I can, you know, still play golf and also help John with the monolith group, um, product. So it just, it does a perfect fit for me. I love it because I'm a finance guy and it's an ingenious patented process that he invented. And, um, yeah, I just, you know, I'm just blessed to, be, you know, be a part of the monolith group. Awesome. Well. Man. That's yeah. great. Mm-hmm. Well, hey, we're going to take a quick break. And when we get back, I want to get into more about that product. I'm interested in hearing more about it and um, all the other stuff that you're doing with the monolith group. We'll be right yeah. back. You want the absolute best for yourself and you want it to be easy. That's why we created green 85. It helps with detoxifying the body gently We're proud it's chemical-free, unlike almost all other supplements you'll find. Bottom line, Green 85 will get you healthier. We look forward to hearing what Green 85 did for you. To get this product and our other amazing products, go to chemicalfreebody.com. That's chemicalfreebody.com. Hey, and Richards, it's Tim and, and 
Tim, and what's your name? Oh, Carter. That's right. We got Carter here. It's my buddy Carter. I know. Something. It's more like it's more like your co-host is like Ted Purdy today. I'm just sitting here kind of being quiet today. Yeah, Ted's Ted's uh, given us some. I mean, there's some gems here, like just what we were talking about about the you know the handwritten letters and personal phone calls and you know the millions of people that you can literally change lives just by a phone call. Like mm -hmm. it's amazing, and the, I mean that's just. I mean, I'm just sitting there thinking about like some little kid that gets to eat a meal because of that phone call, right? Yeah, that phone call. We're literally feeding 500,000 people a month. Yeah. Because yeah. of that phone call. That's pretty, pretty powerful. Just in Phoenix. Yeah. I mean, and that's awesome. That's mm -hmm. awesome. That's, that's, that's that feel good stuff that you, that we really live for. Mm -hmm. So you were talking about the monolith group. You've got this uh, specialized product. It's very niche um, for high net worth individuals where they can get a, a, a ton of life insurance and never write a check. So can you um, uh, for explain that a little bit? Yeah. So uh, John Kazowski was the inventor of it. He um, there's a, in the insurance world, there's um, a product called premium financing. Premium financing is when, you know, a high net worth individual who has a huge estate problem, they, uh, they need life insurance to uh, solve that problem. And what they would do is, but those, those big policies, you know, if it's a 20 or $30 million policy to pay life insurance, those premiums could be a million dollars a year. So a lot of high net worth individuals are like, you know, I need that for my estate, but I don't really want to stroke the check for a million bucks every year for 10 years, you know? So instead of doing it, writing a check for it out of their own pocket for that million bucks a year, they would go to the bank and get, it's called premium financing. They literally get a loan from the bank, just like they get a loan to buy a house. But what they're using the, the, the loan money from the bank is to pay the premiums. So, you know, our high net worth individual now has a, say it's a million dollars a year for 10 years. So now that, that, um, that high net worth individual has a $10 million loan paying his uh, life insurance, but he has to pay interest and principal on that loan. And he has to make sure, you know, his, uh, and the interest rates um, are, are variable and, and higher at the bank. And um, so John had a, uh, his partner was a life insurance, premium finance, life insurance guy, came to John and said, John, the bank rates are way too high. What is the, what are bond rates right now? And he says, well, the, you know, I'm borrowing at the bank from 6% and the seven day lower floater, it's called the seven day LIBOR is at 1%. And John's like, well, I build bonds every day at 1%. So Mike's like, uh, well, why don't we make a bond to pay for life insurance instead of going to the bank and getting a 6% loan? And John Gazowski, my buddy, says, well, I, it's never been done before. How do we, how do I even do that? So um, in 2004, he went and got a process patent. He figured out how to build a bond and sell that into the marketplace and use the proceeds to pay the life insurance instead of having to go to the bank. And so these high net worth individual uh, clients, that $10 million bond is at 1% interest versus a loan at a bank at, at five or six or 7% per se. So um, John just patented the process of uh, being able to borrow basically essentially borrow money at a much low, at the lowest rate possible to solve the high net worth individuals estate tax problems. That's um, it's also used for, for life insurance also used for other things as well. Um, buy sell agreements and, and uh, you know, and for younger clients for, you know, future cash payments or retirement cash payment outlays and things like that. So, um, it's just a, a genius product. I'm, I'm very fortunate to have, you know, 
been taught by Ray Zimmerman and John Gazowski was in my class and, uh, <laughs> and I'm riding his coattails. And so, so my role basically is when the monolith group so gets a call and a, a broker wants to sell the monolith pro, they got a, they got a perfect client for the program, but the insurance agent, the producer doesn't have enough like knowledge of the product to be able to pitch it to their client or to where their client will understand it and have to walk it through. So I'll get a call from John and said, Hey, can, you know, next week, Thursday, can you be in Seattle and meet with the, this client and his, and, a, and the insurance producer and his attorney? I said, sure. So, you know, and if my schedule is free, which is normally is I'll get on a flight, go to Seattle for the day and then get back on and come home. Um, so that's kind of my role for monolith is, you know, I, I just basically help the attorneys and the clients and the insurance agents understand the product. And, um, and hopefully we can uh, close the deal and get them to, to go with the monolith group. That's awesome. Carter, we got to make sure we put uh, his contact information in the show description, the show notes down below. So for the, uh, for those of you advisors out there that uh, would like to, um, um, talk to Ted about this. I think it's, uh, you know, it's a niche deal, but it could come in handy and then he'll come see you and maybe you can get around to golf with him. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> uh, interestingly enough, I remember whenever Ted started talking to me about it um, and, you know, they, they've talked to other different distribution arms like us. And as far as contact goes, you, we can give Ted's contact, but they can also contact me because we have, you know, we've partnered up to be able to bring this to our advisor network. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's it's not like it's something that we don't provide. That's why I wanted, you know, Ted to talk about the Monolith Group yeah. you know, today to let everybody know that that is another resource that we have. Now, obviously, again, these are ultra high net worth clients that we're talking about, right? These are yeah. professional athletes in a lot of situations, or you know, multi conglomerate, you know, uh, high. I, I would say high earning individuals, but a lot of times, you know, they're yeah. business owners or they're well established individuals that are you know worth. 30, 50, 70, you know, hundreds yeah. of million dollars. Yeah. The, the minute, the, the minimum client we say is 10 net worth of 10 million bucks and um, income of 350,000 a year would be kind of the, the bottom, bottom of the, the ability of the program to work um, because that the individual needs to have a need for life insurance. So that the carrier will approve the big, policy and and the bond the smallest bond we can sell in the marketplace is five million dollars so it, it'd have to be a premium of at least a half million a year for 10 years um yeah and then and then of course you know all the and you you touch on a little bit you know even with the younger generation you know this thing we call life insurance a lot of people they think about it as like just death insurance right it's it is self-completing but what a lot of people don't know is that uh you know, you can get tax free income from your life insurance. And that's the that's really the big thing. When you when you show the illustration, when you came in here and I signed the NDA and everything, you know, you're showing how much free income that you can get from it, basically, uh, as well, that becomes leading when the inevitable happens for all of us. Yeah. The younger the client, the, the more opportunity to get tax free income when they're in their retirement, their older years. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So in Richard's. Listen up. If you have uh, if you're a financial advisor, insurance agent out there right now and you really wish you had a very unique differentiator for ultra high net worth individuals, we can be your solution. No doubt about it. Right, Ted? Absolutely. Yeah. Now, we we partnered with uh, CSI and um, we're grateful for all the stuff they do for us. Yeah. So, um, hey, let's talk a little bit. You know, we, we've talked almost seven eighths of this. I know we got a bit. A little bit more time here. And Richards, thank you for staying on all the way through all three segments. I know that Ted Purdy is very gracious with his time today. He's super busy. Obviously, I know he's out there grinding in his backyard in the short game area at Moon Valley Country Club. Um, you know, getting ready for the for the next event. But yeah, our moonwalk's playing good right now. Moonwalk moonwalk is fantastic, absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, the let's talk a little bit about you know, more of the health things that that can, you know, maybe give more insight and, and benefit for those out there. And, and I know that uh, 
Tim, you talk a lot about like your, your four core things or whatever, but let's talk a little bit about things, some takeaways for those who are listening and that they can do it and, and continue to incorporate, uh, you know, Mac Newton, right? You said Mac, yeah, yeah, Mac, yeah, drinking water. Let's talk a little bit about, you know, the water solution that is really key. And, you know, here I am, I've got, uh, I got my, I got my juice, right? I'm on a cleanse right now, so I got my, I got my juice, but I got my, you know, uh, when my, are you gonna get a glass bottle? Yeah, uh, yeah, plastic's not good. Right? Hey, as as send me one. As soon as you send me one, you know, you, you would think I had one of those moonshine bottles being from Arkansas. That's right. <laughs> Let's talk about the kind of water that people need to drink. Also, not necessarily the tap water, and uh, and, and how that can be able to benefit their their energy level and get that flowing. Well, you know, a lot of it is that the water is just polluted today. Um, I think we've talked about it a little bit on a previous episode, but um, with Ted being here, we'll talk about water. You brought it up. So water is polluted today. Um, again, you can go um, 1,500 miles into the interior. You can see the little two and two and a half inch fish today have both male and female organs. Well, why is that? Well, it's because of the estrogen mimickers from plastics, Carter. Oh, that's why. Plastics. Hey, that's so if, if, you, if you want man boobs, you want cervical issues, cervical cysts, breast cancer, prostate issues, um, throwing off your hormones, your thyroid and all that stuff, this, these, these microscopic no plastics have infiltrated into our ecosystem today, right? Same thing like if you're wearing um, – because I remember like when I was playing baseball, we were with those cotton shirts and you get all sweaty and you have to change them, you know. Um, or football and stuff and then they came out with nike dry fit and it was like you know and then under armor stuff it's like it it just kept wicking the the moisture away it was light and you could wear it It was awesome the problem is is those are made from polyesters and now i know that polyester comes from crude oil and it takes like three thousand chemicals to make these things so again you're you're adorning your body your largest organ your skin with plastic and then the plastic these shirts and, and, and underwear and bras and stuff like for bras that are off gassing these plastics. So why am I getting into this? We're talking about water because it's important. It's in the freaking water day. And then every time you wash your, you know, under armor deal or dry fit thing like I used to do, there's these microplastics that come off of it and they go out into the ecosystem, right? So it's, it's a buildup. It's been building up. So that's why we today, we have to make sure that our water is purified. That's number one. The second thing is, is that you have to make sure the water is restructured. And the reason why is because in these high pressure pipes, for those of you listening that are on city tap water, you know, I used to do construction work back when I was, you know, 18, early 20s. And, you know, water's under super high pressure pipes. Like I saw some break and it's like, you know, it's like it'll knock you out. It'll knock you completely out. I mean, it could kill you. It's so much pressure in the bigger pipes. So, um it, it takes these water molecules and it kind of globs them together. So instead of being like four or five clusters, they're in 20 to 25 clusters. And when, what's the deal? Well, when you drink it, it goes into your intestinal tract. And that's where those little clusters are supposed to be able to go through the intestinal lining, which would be like a chain link fence. But the problem is, is they're the size of a bowling ball. They're too big. So they bounce off. So you, you want them to be restructured so that they can go through the intestinal lining, get into the bloodstream, get into the cell and get into the lymphatic system, which is our garbage removal system. So that these other toxins that we've been breathing in and stuff like that can then start getting pushed out by the body naturally through that natural detoxification system called the lymph, the lymph system or the lymphatic system. So this is like really, really important stuff. Um, water is like one of the most it's, it's foundational. The first thing is air and then water. So if you can change your water, you can literally change your life. You can change your energy levels. You can start helping yourself to push out these toxins. And a good rule of thumb is just drinking about half of your body weight in liquid ounces daily of this purified uh, restructured water. And um, if you're a high level athlete or you live in a very arid climate like you guys do, where it's very hot, you might need a little bit more than that. But um, um, I like... Uh, Mac Newton's idea of like, you just drink a lot of water or a hundred percent juice. Um, I, I would just be, you know, it, that's a good thing because it gives somebody some leeway there. They can have a little juice once in a while. You just want to be very careful that it's, um, you know, cause one thing that happens if you just drink in tons and tons of juice and you're not out hustling and moving, that's, that's a lot of calories and that could, that could lead to lead to weight gain. And, um, especially if other issues, like if you have arthritis or, 
uh, cancer or problems like that. Uh, too much sugar is like throwing gasoline on a bonfire as far as health goes. It's very acid. So just make sure you get that water in there first. Nice. Awesome. That's, uh, th- those are obviously great takeaways. Uh, Ted Purdy, you, you've got, you know, my my co-host, Tim James here. Is there anything additionally that, you know, health-wise or whatever, obviously, Mac Newton's got y'all, you know, squared away, <laughs> got some structure yourself. Is there anything from um, from his perspective as a, as a, a health coach that you want to, want to ask him and then, and then we'll let our enrichers get going. And uh, obviously thank you very much for being on here again today. Yeah. I, I think I know the answer to this, but what do you think of like the sports drinks and the, the guys on tour putting those packets of crap in their water? And um, what do you think about all that? Well, I'll give you an example. If you're talking about like Gatorade, Gatorade or, you know, the, yeah. Sports. We'll just take Gator as an example. Well, I, I knew back even when I was a financial, or actually before I was a financial advisor, when I was in the mortgage industry, um, I had a client and his job was he owned a bottling company. So people don't realize this, but like Coca-Cola and Pepsi and, and Gatorade and Red Bulls and that kind of stuff, they don't bottle that stuff somewhere and then just send it all over the place. They send the raw materials to local bottling places and the bottling places make it. So this guy had purchased the biggest the biggest expense in his entire business, he had these big steel vats. And at the bottom of these vats are these gears that, that spin and turn the ingredients to mix it to go to bottle. And he said his busy, busy, biggest expense was replacing those gears. <laughs> Why would you need to replace the gears? Because the acid in the products would like they would just it would eat them up. They'd go away. So think about this. Number one. What the hell is are that are we drinking that's we're gonna eat a metal massive big huge metal gear right? And he said the worst of the worst. He goes, what do you think? He goes, what do you think's worse? He goes, do you think it's Gatorade? Do you think it's the Red Bulls? Or do you think it's um uh, it was like some other energy drink he mentioned or something like that? And I was like, um, I don't know. Uh, and I, I said I said like the energy drink probably. And he's like uh, the, the Red Bull. And he's like, no, it's the Gatorade. The Gatorade eats the shit out of those gears. Um, <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh, my God. And from and I used to be – I would go play baseball, and I'm getting my red Gatorade and my green one. Those are the two flavors that I like. I stopped drinking that shit immediately after he told me that because I'm like, if it's eating the gears of a metal deal, what's it doing to my guts? And then the metal that it's eating is getting blended into that stuff, and then I'm eating it. So I'm like, I'm out of there. Now, <laughs> your other point – those packets, it all depends on the ingredients. Somebody could actually do this because it was like one of my goals like five years ago when I was talking to our formulator, Dr. Treadwise, like we could make like a uh, like a little packets. We could have a sugar alternative. We could do um, like a sports drink type thing. And and um, I actually have a client right now that just came out with an energy drink that we helped formulate for them. And it tastes delicious. And you freaking get, whoo, I mean, it's awesome. I they're just about done with it. I have the samples and I'm like, I'm adding it into my regimen because it's like better, better ship me some. Dude, it's like our, our green 85 product. Like this is the one Ted that this is our number one seller, our green. So oh, yeah. this replaces the 85% of the stuff in the soil. But um this energy drink deal that this guy's got, he's got the right ingredients because they're actually from nature, right? It doesn't have any of these synthetics and these chemicals and these weird things and the, some things are banned on the EPA's uh you know, or they're on the EPA's list of toxins, but they're in, in sports drinks and in and, and supplements and drinks and stuff like that. So yeah, yeah I, you're, you're right. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't touch that stuff with a 10 foot pole. Yeah, no, that's cool. Wow. I learned a lot. That was good. <laughs> By the way, you know, um, you completely changed. You're going to wreck Carter Samuel, just so you know, after you just got through saying that Carter Samuel's favorite drink is G2, right? Oh, well there's, it's, it's sugar free. So, um yeah we're probably not going to be able to buy gatorade anymore for my son so <laughs> i'll say hey gatorade g-a gatorade is it should stand for gut acid because that's what it does man it's just going to eat your guts away <laughs> and your ears <laughs> <laughs> i mean here's another one guys like i don't i can't like if you go to an auto body shop anybody go check this go to an auto body shop and a lot of auto body shops are using like coca-cola and pepsi to remove like pitch off of trees and stuff like that off of cars. Like yeah. that's what they do to clean cars. They eat, cause it's acid. It just eats stuff and we're drinking that. So I think that's why um, 
Ted had so much results with Mac Newton's program because it's not so much of what he was eating. It's what he wasn't eating. The standard American diet is so bad that when you get off of it at all, every, your life's going to improve. Mm-hmm. And I really like what he shared. I think that's really good. We like to take things to another level. We go to raw and even living foods. So sprouting and sprouted nuts and seeds and grains and beans because you need living foods for a living body. And then you can have energy like me, like a chipmunk. And, um, <laughs> have your nerves be very calm when you're doing that final putt on the 18th green. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. The, the three, the three footer left to right downhill. Yeah. The energy without the shakes. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. That's, that's great stuff. Well, Hey, uh, enrichers, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, for this special podcast, my dear friend, Ted, <laughs> PGA Tour winner, uh, thank you so much for joining us today to be on here and sharing so much insightful information about your backstory and where you're at today. Uh, and, and again, uh, my co-host, Tim James, I want to thank both of you guys so much for the, for the time today. Yeah, and if you guys, hey, I appreciate it, Carter. If you guys uh, like this episode, please give us a like, share the episode, leave us a, leave us a note. You know, if you have questions or comments, we we really appreciate that. We really thank you for for uh, liking and sharing and doing all that good stuff. Yeah, and and by the way, Enrichers, uh, if you're listening to this, you probably have downloaded our uh, our episodes. We are on Apple Podcasts. We're on Spotify, nice and easy to be able to find us out there. The Health and Wealth Podcast with Carter and Tim. Thank you guys all for joining us today. Thank you and Richard so much. Ted Purdy again, (laughs) so gracious of his time and being able to come on and tell us all the great things that's going on with his life right now. Thanks, guys. That was fun. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Hey, guys. Hey, and Richards, thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Health and Wealth Podcast. I'm your host, Carter Wilcoxon. And I'm your host, Tim James. And by God, we are committed to helping you guys have fat wallets, flat bellies. So tune in again for another episode and make sure to like, share, and drink a lot of water. Or beer. You have just listened to the Health and Wealth Podcast with Carter and Tim.